Welcome to this session. Um, it's about Drupal 8, and it's, uh, it's about Drupal 8 as being what I would call the site builder's release. Um, if you have any questions, um, you can tweet at the, the hashtag or um, come and talk to me afterwards. Of course, I will be here for until until Sunday evening. So, um, just a few words about me. Um, I'm an I'm a Drupal 8 site builder, oh no, sorry, I'm a Drupal site builder. Um, I mainly build websites for small NGOs and grassroots organizations. So I'm very used to building sites that need to be really sustainable because most of these organizations have very small budgets and they, they need to be maintained and updated with as little fuss as possible. Um, and quite often there isn't much money for actually doing nice fancy extra bits. Um, and I'm also a member of the documentation working group which basically means that over the years um, I fix those documentation that looks broken to me because once I've un I understood it, I think it's good if other people can understand it as well. So um, there's lots of work to be done in documentation and if anybody wants to sprint on that on Sunday, you're more than welcome to help, help us with that. Um, just a few questions about you so I have an idea who's in the room. Um, who has actually built sites with Drupal 8 so far? Well, a few. Um, um, who has built sites with Drupal 7 before? Okay. Any site builders who haven't used Drupal? Okay, one um, or two. So um, this, this session is really meant for everybody um, who has any idea about site building or about Drupal 7. There might be some collective size that people who haven't used Drupal 7 might not understand, but that should be all of it. Um, and if you have any questions, just ask. Um, are there any module maintainers around as well? Okay, um, I've got to have a question or a request for you later at some stage. Mm, so, what is a site builder? Um, I've actually learned that site builder is something very Drupal specific. Um, but in general, a site builder is somebody who basically puts things together so that others can use the site. Um, and for Drupal, that also means that as site builders, we actually have a lot of knowledge about the Drupal, the Drupal ecosystem, about how Drupal works, not only technically, but also as a community, where to find our modules. Um, and we have a lot of kind of commonly tasks that whenever I start a site, I know there are certain things I do, like I turn off overlay, I install this module, I install that module. Um, and we have our own workflows for actually deploying changes between development sites and, and live sites. Um, however, that quite often is very specific per, per site builder. So I think every site builder has like their own tool, toolbox, their own things that they do, um, which is fine, except for when you have to take over a site that somebody else worked on, or you have to work together with somebody who has a different workflow, who has a completely different naming structure, or you can't find the things in features. So there's quite a bit of friction because we all have our own sets. And I think so far there has been the standard remark on, well, there's a module for that. I think with Drupal 8 we have moved also to, that's in core. But we have also moved to, our shared toolbox has become bigger. The more there is in Drupal 8 core, the more we can rely on other people doing it, using the same tools. Um, and I'm just going to show you um, some of my, my highlights that are going to be in Drupal, or that are in Drupal 8 now. What has changed is actually all of this, um, which is the change log, I think, from the release candidate too. So I'm not going to go through all of that. I think there are like some 140 lines of changes, just between Drupal 7 and Drupal 8. Um, and we still have Drupal 6 to Drupal 8 sites. So, so my top 10 are actually um, these 10 topics I'm going to go through. Um, there's much more, but we're just going to keep it for those 10 for the moment. So. Better editor experience. Um, quite often there is money and is designed for front end, but there is no design and little time to actually make the back end for the actual site editor, site users much more useful. Um, and when you go to Drupal camps and Drupal cons, you quite often see that there are lots of sessions about which modules to use to actually make the back end usable, which admin menu modules or so to install. Um, with Drupal 8, lots of the 
there's lots of more functionality in Core that makes it actually a much better editor experience. And I'm just going to show you a video which is about one minute where you can see how much you can actually do as an editor now with stuff that is in Core. So basically you have the, you have actually have a proper, proper admin menu that is kind of tucked away and you can have it either vertically or horizontally. Um, you can change menu links without even knowing how this menu is called, just from the quick edit links. Um, the quick edit links also works for actually changing content. So if you find a typo in the title of an article, you don't have to go to find the right page. You can just actually click on these click edit, uh, quick edit links and you can see that you can just turn them on for the full page. And you also find, because the icon shows up everywhere, you can actually quite easily just click on this icon and change whatever you need changing. So in, as far as I know, um, one, one minute and four seconds, it's possible to kind of um, hide a menu item, fix a typo in a title, and change the slogan of the site without actually ever needing to go to the back end, without ever needing to cons consult these little post-it notes that people end up having on their computer to find out where the hell to change this or that. So I think that already makes it much easier for site editors. I mean, they can actually spend their time on putting content on the, on the site instead of searching in the back end. Um, WYSIWYG editor. WYSIWYG editor is in core, which to me is like one of the biggest reliefs because it means it doesn't have, I, doesn't have, I don't have to go and check out any libraries or um, find that another site builder used a different library and the buttons I'm looking for aren't there. But there's also some other nice thing that I found um, when we were writing the documentation and we are trying out all the little buttons. And that is that um, the buttons that you, sh that you see in the toolbar are actually rendered by HTML. So if you forget to add an HT um, allowed HTML tag, like emphasis or so, that button won't show up to the user. So you never have the situation that the users think, I've edited my text nicely. It should be italics and it doesn't show up. Because if you forget that button, uh, if you forget that HTML tag as allowed, the user won't see it. The problem will only be with you and not with the users using it afterwards. Um, nearly everything is fieldable in Drupal 8 now, which means yeah, you can basically add, first of all, there's much more new field types, like you have date, link, email, phone numbers, and an entity reference for pretty much everything, as fields available in core. So you, and you can add them to pretty much everything. Like where I used to use um, web form quite often when you have a contact form and needs additional fields. Now you just can actually add another field to the contact form. And um, for all of these entities, you can actually also um, configure the form display separately. So if you want to have a placeholder in your form, um, if you want to show the image in a certain size when it's uploaded, you can all of, configure all of that separately per entity. So um, why, why is that relevant? Well, I'll just give you one example for the user picture, for example. In the first seven years, you could just add you, um, a user picture to a user account. That's fine. But for example, you couldn't set it as required. And when you wanted to move it around on the account page, you couldn't because it's not a field. So now it's simply a field that is predefined, it's set up there, and if you want to move it above or below the name or whatever, um, you can just do that as any other field. So I think that means that once you've understood how, how, to, use with, how to work with fields, it doesn't matter whether you look at a user account or a taxonomy term or a note, it just all works the same. So there's much less time in learning to figure out why this is just slightly different than that. Um, there's a few more things where there's actually more from now. Um, so far Drupal 7 just has one, one contact form. And if you need several contact forms, for example, because you have a general contact form, but you also have a contact form where people can subscribe to your uh, news, 
to your written newsletter by post and you have extra fields for the address. So if I, you had the one contact form and you would need web form or so to make another contact form. Um, now you can simply set up several different contact forms with different fields. Uh, the one regression I've, I've come across between Drupal 7 and Drupal 8 is that we don't have categories anymore for contact forms. So in Drupal 7, you could have different categories and then say if people clicked on, okay, this is um, a feedback or information question, it would, would be sent out to different, um, di different email addresses. Which I find quite useful for the kind of sites I'm building. Um, now you will have to make several different contact forms. So if anybody wants to write me a contract module, then that would be to have a nice way of combining all of these contact forms in one pull-down menu or so. Um, the other things where we have more types from is comments. Um, first of all, comments are, can be added as a field to any, any entity. So you can actually add comments on the contact form page or on a blog, um, if you can think of a use case for that. Um, but you can also have different types of comments. Um, and I think I'm just taking an example that Gabo gave in his multilingual um, talk in in Barcelona. For example, if you have a site that has comments but also has reviews, for example, reviews of computer games, you might actually want to have a field that um, where people have to fill in a certain additional field. So you can say, okay, we have a normal comment for discussion, but we also have a, a review comment where you have to fill in the version number on the screenshot or so. When I was making these slides, I actually realized that if you add an image to a comment, at the moment, uh, the theming breaks. Um, but for the rest, it all works fine. Um, and while I found that out, it's also, as a, as a site builder, if you come across something like that, if you add fields and they just don't quite work, or they, in this case, they were floating next to each other in a weird way, just file an issue. Because chances are that the people actually um, developing the code for that have never actually made a contact form where for some weird reason you add up five different fields in an image. So don't sit there grumble and say, oh, this doesn't really work, and now I have to kind of override this with CSS. No, go in the issue queue, check whether there's an issue, and if not, just make a screenshot and describe briefly what you've done, and somebody will get on it to fix it. Um, blocks. I have to admit that so far I'm avoiding blocks like hell because blocks can't be, in, in Drupal 6 and 7, blocks can't go in features. So you end up with this, I have a block and when I deploy it on the live site I actually have to go and do it on the live site as well, which is not a sane workflow I think. Um, however, in Drupal 8, blocks are entities with a configuration that can be that can be stored and deployed just as anything else. Um, that can be exported and you don't have to do any fiddling on the production side anymore. Um, for blocks now, the content and the configuration has actually been split up into two different bits. So for example, if you have an, um, a block with an address in it, the address is the content, um, but you cannot, and you can place it, for example, in the footer, but you might want to place it somewhere else really, um, really prominently with, a, with an additional header on top of it to say, like, come and visit us at our, our location or so. And because configuration and content are separate, you can actually place the block several times. So you can put it once in the footer without a heading and once on your contact page with a heading. And if you ever figure out that you have a typing, address in your, uh, typing error in your address, you just change it once and it's changed wherever you use that, that block. Um, multilingual. Um, I only go over that briefly because um, we can actually go for a whole session about that at 3 o'clock. Um, my main point that I just want to mention here is that um, you can now translate content interface and configuration. Um, so far, lots of interface text was more difficult to. Well, um, let's start again. Um, one of the nice tricks I've, I've found is that um, so far, if you wanted to change interface text that's hard coded, 
you would go to the settings of PHP file and say, oh, actually don't say like save translation, um, um, display, save this translation instead. You would have to do that in the settings of PHP file. Now, there, and there was always this trick of saying, well, if I add English as another language, I can translate this English to English um, and it will show up. And now there's actually a small tick box for that. Um, what you see in the, in the top one, there's an enable interface for translation. So you can actually also, if you want to override the hard-coded interface text, you can actually do that through the, uh, through the translation modules. Um, you can also translate configuration. And my, for, for me, one of the nicest things you can translate in terms of translation are dates, dates and um, time formats. Because quite often, well, you have the site set up with a, with a date format. And Drupal 8, I think, by default comes with the American date format. Um, but even if you have a site that's bilingual between German and English, you not only want to translate the February to February, um, you also want to have a dot after the day in German, where you don't have it in English. So you can actually just translate the date format um, depending on language. And you can even make a site that has two different English formats, so that you only have the American format for the American English, and you have um, a normal date format for the rest of the world. And uh, um, in general, as you can also see on these examples, the admin interface for translating has, has dramatically improved. Quite often, in a Drupal 7 site, if you want to translate, for example, contact and the text on the contact form, you would go and search for contact, and it comes up like three times, and you don't know which one is the one that actually shows up on the page, so you translate all three of them, and you probably miss it somewhere, and there's another one. Um, and then you go and find the text that's on the page. Now if you go and look for, for, for translations, you find them kind of categorized by blocks, and if you click on contact form, you just get this, okay, translate the label, trans translate the auto-reply text, and you have the two things that go together. So I think that makes it much faster for translators. And much easier to say to translators, okay, just um, go and find that, that bit of content that belongs together, and not translate contact three times because we are really not sure which one is which one. So I think that will increase the workflow a lot. And for all other goodies and improvements of translation, go to Gabor's session. Configuration management. Um, configuration management in Drupal 8 is completely redone, completely new. Um, in Drupal 7, we mainly using features which aren't actually meant for configuration management, but have been used for that a lot. And if you just look at an example, um, so that, that's an example from a site that I worked on with, together with somebody else. Um, we ended up with different naming strategies. Um, I'm looking at this and think, oh gosh, somewhere in there is this, is this one field. Or So you end up with this whole list of different features that all of them have several files in them. Um, and then have, have the, the actual text or the output in the file um, in a very technical format. So quite often also you end up with merge conflicts and as nice as features are, um, they also take up a hell of a lot of time. So in Drupal, in Drupal 8, there's this completely new um, configuration management where all the configuration goes in separate YAML files. They look much more like text files. Um, when you, when you actually look at this, you end up with a whole list of them, which might be intimidating, but the nice thing is they actually have automated names. So if you have something that in one side is in whatever system menu main YAML, on the next side you're working with, the same information will be in that same file called system module main whatever I just said. Um, so it's much clearer. Um, also from the, from the admin interface, you have a much clearer overview to say what has actually changed 
in the more human readable form that as a site builder you might want to have. So in this case you can see that um, what was called mailing list um, is now called mailing list subscription and it's not sent to admin but to info. Um, so I think that's much more easy accessible. Can we choose a way to be using this way uh, application file? Sorry? Can we choose what we put in this file? Um, everything goes into those files. Everything? Everything. So you don't actually have to, to choose anymore and then you miss something. No, everything, every configuration you do goes into these individual YAML files. Um, and for example, if you delete, like if you make a new content type, a new YAML file is made for that content type. Um, and if you delete a content type, it's actually also taken out again, so it's deleted. So you don't end up with old configuration that is left over. But if, if we have a difference uh, between uh, production and our development, mm -hmm. uh, can we uh, exclude some uh, configuration? Oh, uh, yes. Um, what, what you see here is actually also, um, there's a step where you can, you can export your configuration from your, from your um, development or staging site and import it to your production site, um, either by copying text across, um, which I'll just show in a, in a moment, or by exporting the whole archive of all of these files in one go. And then you have a step in between where um, you can actually see what the changes will be before you approve them on your site. So you can actually also have your configuration for your development site and your configuration for your live site. Both of them will be in files like this. So it also means that you can make sure that your configuration for your live site always has the, for example, the aggregation of CSS files turned on. And you don't end up forgetting that. Um, I'm just going to give you a short example where you can see um, um, how that works on the GUI. Um, on how you can actually choose these individual files. There is a longer session this afternoon, I think at four o'clock, about configuration management, and there's a very good video um, from the presentation that Alex Pot gave in Barcelona for, um, for actually seeing much more in detail how, how this works. So this is the configuration management page where you can just take a single export and you can see like, okay, you can actually choose, I just want to know the configuration for the basic HTML text format. And you see it actually comes just with this content without the mark, markup of the, um, the PHP files that you would have had in features. So you can very easily from the, from the drop down menus say, okay, I just want to export um, the changes that I made to the contact form or to this content type, or in this case, to this specific um, text format. You can either just um, copy-paste this configuration across, which is a single im and export, or you can really um, export the whole archive, all the YAML files in one go, um, and actually then put them also properly in Git. So you can have your, your whole configuration um, in the Git repository. And I think there's some work on, on contract modules as well, so that you can actually, also from the GUI, actually... Um, already commit those changes to Git, but I think that's still in a development stage and I haven't actually tried that out. Oh, has anybody? I think to me that that's like a really nice step because I'm too often working with people who say, I don't do features, I don't want to do Git, I don't want to get on the command line. Um, so if we can actually through the GUI make sure that stuff goes into the repositories and getting deployed properly, I think then all together we are big step further. Um, the number nine on my top ten is migration. I don't know um, who of you might have been in the previous session about the migration API. Um, if not, it's worth watching the video of that, um, which described migration much more in detail. <laughs> the short of it is that so far. Um, you had to upgrade your site, like from 5 to, when Drupal 7 came out, we had to upgrade from 5 to 6, and from 6 to 7. Um, this upgrade pass now basically has been, um, has been removed, and there's migration, which means you can migrate directly from 6 to 8, in the same way as you can migrate from 7 to 8, or 
in the same way as if you would migrate data from a different content system into a Drupal site. So again, that means that um, once you figure out how the migrations work, it's actually something you can reuse for different sites. Um, there's two migration modules which are in Drupal 8. Both of them are actually described as experimental uh, modules in the, on the extent page. Um, they currently don't come with a UI. They come with a drush command. Um, and there is a, a contract module to actually provide the UI. My experience for the migration that I've done so far is more that um, it's actually quite nice to install the, the contract module to see the UI, to see what it says, what can be migrated straight away and what can't, but then still use the drush command because that seems to be... Our, I had problems that the, the UI would be timing out. Um, there's lots of work going on on the migration modules, um, especially also because by... what is it? 24th of February next year, the, the security support for Drupal 6 will stop, so we should all be migrating our Drupal 6 sites. Um, and as the previous speaker said, um, this migration needs lots of testing in the wild. So as site builders, you're all um, invited to do a bit of testing of these migration modules. And then the last of my Top 10 is Views. Views is in core. Um, who of you has used Views? Huh? Who of you haven't used Views? Okay. Well, first of all, Views is in core, which I think, yeah, just means one less module I have to install to maintain. But for me, actually, the, the best part of it is that Views are actually used for admin pages. And I'll show you what that means from a Drupal 7 example. It was an external module in Drupal 7. Yeah, in Drupal 7 it was an external module and now it's in core, so you don't have to install it. Um, but it also means that um, we can actually rely on it, in, re rely on views being there. Um, this is an example from a Drupal 7 site that I just built um, where I was using the relationship module. And I just wanted to swap these two columns around. Because I and rename one of the columns from relationship to interaction, which I thought, well, that's easy. It's column. It's a table. I just swap them around, change the label, done. Um, except it wasn't. So I ended up with um, writing, I think, four um, hook form orders, um, just for changing this. Um, and since I'm writing very little code, that's also having to ask and having to kind of fiddle around and just see whether it works without, for some parts, knowing exactly what I've done there. Um, and I think it took several hours. So if you go to Drupal 8, you find that an admin page like this, but just a normal content page, um, is a view. So if for whatever reason um, the site editors later will need another, another column in there or swap them around, then just go to the views page, click on edit this view, i just change the fields, change the label, swap them around, and be done with it. Um, and that's the, where were the site builders in the room, or the module maintainers in the room? So, um, what, as a site builder, I want from you is, please, please, make your admin pages with views. Because first of all, it means it's much easier and much faster for site builders to, to actually change it. If, our idea is what to do with your module goes beyond what you thought. Um, and it's also much safer and much, much more secure because I know what I'm doing when I'm moving these two columns around. I don't know what I did when I moved, when I did that. I don't know whether there's any, any security issues happening if I'm moving stuff that, that should be simple. Um, and it also means that your modules become much more extendable because in this case, um, I had an idea of what to do with the module that the module maintainer hadn't really thought of. I was using verbs as interaction instead of nouns. And therefore just this needed swapping around. So if we can do more with your module, because you let us, um, you actually have way less feature requests in the issue queue as well. Uh, a question. Wouldn't it be possibly more safer to when I have a use case like this, a new one, uh, to actually copy the existing view to a new one, 
and as a, and as Rock and Letter supported to subcons as etc. because of the upgrade part of the of Drupal 8. Um the question was whether it would be safer to just um, copy the view and make a new one. Um, I would think for something where um, I need to I change the order of the fields and views and things like that, that's a configuration change um, that, I, first of all, shouldn't be overwritten with upgrades, I hope. Um, and it also means that um, the, the, um, the, the page, if you would make a new page, you would come up with a new path, which means um, the other modules that might rely on something being there or it being in the menu at a certain place, um, you would have to, to check all of that. Um, I would feel pretty confident in just changing the view there. Um, but I think that's also something that's worth playing around with. Um, but I think for, for those kind of changes, I would be quite happy just do it with that one. Um, and if there's ever a problem, um, you can still kind of compare it to a, a new Drupal 8 install to see whether what the changes were. So, so that basically were my top 10 um, Drupal, Drupal 8 improvements. There's much more. Um, there's lots of changes, for example, for accessibility. Like we now have an option of visually hidden field labels. So you can actually hide the field label from the user, but still make it accessible to the screen reader. So it's like best of both worlds, I think. And there's a few more things in terms of accessibility, um, which all together, um, A, I haven't really played with, but B, there's also a session this afternoon who goes through them. And of course, there's also much more in Contrib. So um, there's lots of work going on um, with the search and passive modules. Um, the media modules are getting consolidated. Like in Drupal 7, there's all these different media modules that all do kind of similar things overlapping, but not quite what you want, so you end up with several. And the maintainers of several media modules actually sat together and really kind of split their different modules into more functional blocks. Um, so um, there, that should be a really useful um, set of contract modules. And one of my other favorites is that panel display suite now actually have layouts that are fully interchangeable. So far you had like one, the, the layouts from panels could be used in display suite or the other way around, um, but not in both directions. Now you don't really have to decide on whether to use one or the other. You, if you want to, you can use both and your layouts will be the same. For the state of the contrib modules, there's actually something called um, the, um, it's the Drupal Project Contrib Tracker. It also has its own website called Contrib Kanban, where if you're working on, um, if you're working on upgrading or migrating a site, you can actually check in which state the modules are that you're using, whether they have an alpha release or a beta, or whether they're stable. And you can also see which modules are in core or which modules are renamed. So you don't spend months of time searching to find out um, what the state of your modules are. Anything else you need to know about contrib modules? Well, mainly that it's up to you to contribute now to them. Because I think as site builders, we are like um, especially equipped to actually find out the real use cases of all of these modules. So go play around with them, and if there's any problem, if like the image field floats up, or um, for some reason there was a, um, you can't add taxonomy terms to two vocabularies at the same time, even so there's a button that says you should. Um, all of those things, when you come across them, just file an issue. Um, go to the issue queue, make your screenshot, describe what you've done, and somebody can work on it. And also review the patches that are there. Try them out on your sites. And even if you only say, this patch works, or this patch didn't apply anymore, that's actually what needed for, for developers, for module maintainers, to actually continue their work. And as a member of the documentation team, I was like, yes, please help us update the documentation. Because we spent the last, I think, five years updating the documentation for the modules on the help pages. But now there's lots of work on Drupal.org that still needs to be done. 
to actually make this page as much more workable. And was that um, as time for questions? And well, if you want to know about multilingual, if you want to know about configuration management or accessibility, there are sessions for that. And for the rest, please come to the sprint on Sunday. Thank you. Um, does quick edit work with views? Um, the question was whether quick edit work works with views. Um, as far as I know, yes. Mm -hmm. Because the, um, the yeah, I think um, I've tried it on the on the front page, which is generated by a view, and there you can also um, um, use them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it depends. Depends. Okay. So if so, if the view renders the entity. Then you have enough wrapper markup for quick edit to put the functionality on. Mm -hmm. If you use a data table or just a list of titles or something, then it usually does not have enough wrapper markup to be able to tell what data belongs to which entity, and then it's, it's pretty much from the, well, it's, not, it's not impossible to make quick edit work, but it does not work yet. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have two shout-outs. <laughs> <laughs> One is um, if you want to, like, who was not here yesterday at the contract module session, on the Blackboard, there is still the URL for the 8th upgrade, which is a free service that we're doing for the community that checks what modules are already updated on our site. So just give it the URL and your email address, and it will generate a report for you. And there's even a, a medical forum, so if you're a consultant, you can use it to figure out who of your customers is interested in upgrading. And we're playing nice, so we can find it. The other one is, um, uh, oh, I'm really excited about seeing this session. <laughs> because um, um, I think that we as site builders, uh, we need to have our own kind of venue and our own meetup and our own community. Um, because um, most conferences are very developer oriented. And I think that we need something for site builders when you don't necessarily like working in command line even, um, that you, we would have our own venue. And there's an event that is growing, it's not uh, announced or completely uh, figured out yet when it's going to be. It's called Drupal Uncoded, and it's an event for us site builders. And if you're interested in that, look at uh, bit.ly forward slash uncoded, uh, sign up there, put your email address in, and then you'll get an email when there's more. And also blog post. And if you want to find all of that, it's on Twitter. And that's Thanks. <laughs> um, yes, I recommend you go there. Even so, I disagree with the that as site builders we should be sitting somewhere else because I think what's really great about Drupal as as a community is actually that we have um, the site builders, the seamers, the developers all together, and that we can end up with something like. Somebody who has been complaining for years about the design and too many diffs in there, actually going and changing it. Um, and therefore, I think also there is lots of space and lots of need for site builders to integrate with, for example, the issue queue. And not just sitting somewhere else and say it doesn't work. Um, which is why I think there's also so much scope for site builders to go to sprints. It's about identity. It's about <laughs> saying it's okay to be a site builder. <laughs> <laughs> as, as you notice, we had that discussion before. <laughs> uh, any more questions about um, site building issues, modules? Um, otherwise, I would say it's time for. Oh, yeah. hmm? um, we, we started migrating from our own uh, content management system to Drupal 7. Um, mm -hmm. Since it's quite a lot of content, quite a lot of sites, um, it started about two years ago, and we are now more or less in a stable position to say, yeah, uh, half of it is done, mm -hmm. the rest half can move. When shall we start telling our bosses we should think about Drupal 8? Oh, the, the question is like, when, when, while you're currently still migrating sites to Drupal 7, when should, when should you think about Drupal 8? Um, I think that depends very much on the kind of sites you have. Um, I've heard yesterday, for example, that facets are actually working with um, with search, and that search API is also pretty far. Um, 
But for example, if you have a site that relies heavily on media and including um, videos and Twitter feeds and everything, um, I would, for example, definitely work on the wait until the media modules are, are out. Um, plus, um, the, the release cycle of Drupal has changed. So while previously we had like Drupal 5 to Drupal 6, and then there's a long, long gap before Drupal 7 came out, and then there's another long, long gap before Drupal 8 comes out, and the changes are really big. The release cycle for Drupal 8 is going to be different. Um, so there will be much much more kind of smaller um, feature ad features be or features being added over time in a six months period. Um, so there will Drupal 8 will still be improving further, um, which also means that um, you don't end up with something where then in five years the support for Drupal 7 will suddenly stop or so. So I think that Drupal 7 still has a lot of lots of lifetime in it, and especially um, if you have if you have organizations that have several sites, um, you also don't want to confuse people with having something in seven and something in eight and something still in the old system. Um, so I think it depends a lot on what you are using. I've basically rebuilt a Drupal six site um, which had thirty contrib modules just in core. So for those kind of sites. Um, Yes, going to Drupal 8 on a release candidate was fine. But other sites, I think, check the stages of your contract modules, um, choose some smaller sites for trying it out, um, play around with it. And, you don't need to worry about uh, Drupal 7 support. No, no, I don't think because so. Because it's an easier conversation to have two years down the line saying maybe you should talk about Drupal 8. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? Okay, then I think there's lunch break. Thanks, everybody.